So today we'll cover the second part of thinking. We'll go into judgment, decision making, and reasoning. So we'll cover a lot of the research by um, some very famous researchers in psychology and as well as economics. Uh, Tversky and Kahneman. So here's Tversky and Kahneman. You might have seen a book by Kahneman in a bookstore or online, Thinking Fast and Slow. Have you guys seen that book? It's, it's one of those bestsellers um, uh, in, the, in, in the science categories. So Tversky and Kahneman, um, they investigated human decision making and uh, human judgment. And they found that um, people deviate in interesting ways from optimal reasoning or optimal decision making. So when it comes down to uh, making decisions about money or judging the likelihood of events, there are some ways in which you should reason. Um, and probability theory, uh, utility theory, um, are ways to tell us how we should reason about money and, and probabilities and risk, etc. But sometimes we deviate in interesting ways from optimal uh, reasoning. And Tversky and Kahneman um, try to explain uh, what is going on. Uh, why do we make these mistakes? So they proposed that our judgment, specifically our judgment, our our ways to derive the, the, the likelihood of events is based on heuristics. Now, a heuristic is a rule of thumb. Uh, it's a procedure that um, is not guaranteed to lead to the correct answer, but it's a simple procedure. Um, it's easy to implement a procedure, and the reason why you use it is that it's so simple and it often works, but not always. Another word for heuristic is a mental shortcut. So one reason that you might um, use heuristics is because uh, they don't require a lot of thinking. Um, it lowers the cognitive load. Um, instead of um, you making decisions on the basis of you know, using paper and pen and complicated uh, calculations, um, you often don't have the time to make uh, decisions um, uh, often you need to make decisions and reason in a sort of in a short time span, and then heuristics become very useful. But they can lead to systematic errors and biases, where your reasoning is just systematically off. And Tversky and Kahneman, they, they carefully documented these, uh, these kinds of errors. Uh, now, they did a lot of work jointly, and they have some really uh, famous papers uh, in the field. Tversky died, I think, a couple of years ago. Um, and Kahneman received ultimately the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, there's no Nobel Prize in psychology, otherwise it would have been rewarded in, in that category. So he, he was awarded in, in economics. Um, and probably Tversky should have gotten it too if, if he were alive. So we'll talk about two example heuristics, uh, representativeness and availability. So let's start with a little example, a little experiment. I'll uh, show some names of people. Some of those names you might recognize. And I'll ask you some questions about those names later. It's, it's a little bit like a memory test. So here's a sequence of names. Okay, got that? Now, I won't ask you to recall the names of those people. That would be one way to do a memory test. It's a very simple question. Were there more female names than male names on that list? Were there more male names than female names on that list? So how many of you think there were more male names on that list? So is it fair to say that's a majority? How many of you say same? That's pretty good. 
The answer is in fact the same. There were 18 names on that list. And there are nine female names, nine male names. Now, of course, you notice that something is going on here. The male names happen to correspond to actors uh, that are well known, or at least they were very well known. This is a little dated, this slide, actually. These used to be A-list actors. Um, some of those are probably not A-list actors anymore, like Mel Gibson, I guess. Um, but the, uh, the female names are I'm from, the, I think, from a D-list, right, the, the less well-paid uh, actors. And so some of you might not even recognize those names, the female names. And when I ask you how many male names are there versus female names, you use a simple strategy of uh, the fluency with which uh, names come to mind in one category versus another. Uh, so how many instances can you retrieve uh, of the male category versus female category? And it tends to be, for most of you, easier to think of the male names. Those come more readily to mind. And that's what you base your answer on. So this strategy of using the ease of which instances come to mind as a way to uh, answer questions about probability or likelihood or frequency, that's called the availability heuristic. So obviously, we can't keep track of all events in the world. Right? We just don't have the capacity to do that. You, you might not have the capacity to remember verbatim all those, all those names. So you have to use a strategy. And the availability heuristic is a very simple strategy. Right? You remember a few instances. You forget about others. And then later, any questions about, those, um, about that list is addressed by just retrieving instances. But in this case, the instances of the male names became more easy to mind. And so that leads to this mistake. Um, the incorrect answer. Here's another question. You can't possibly know um, or you can't possibly enumerate all words in the English language. There's a lot of them. So you have to use instances that come to mind when you answer this question. Um, are there more words in the English language that begin with the letter V or have V as the third letter? So do you think there are more words that start with V or that have V in the third position? Yeah, it's actually far more likely to have a V in the third position. But if you do the experiment, um, many people would say um, it's more likely that a V is in the first position because that's easier uh, to come up with instances of words that start with a certain letter. And the same is true for the letter R, K, L, and N. Uh, for all those letters, it's more likely to have them in the third position than in the first position. So this is an example of the availability heuristic again, right? So you, your judgment about the likelihood is based on the ease of, of uh, instances coming to mind. Now here, this is um, another example. So if you think about uh, causes of death, what's more likely? And I should note um, that your thinking has to go back to the 1970s because some of the examples are a little dated. Uh, so, so let's start with the second example because this example still works today. So what is more likely to die from, from homicide or suicide? So many people would say homicide, but the truth is suicide is far more likely. Uh, it's almost twice as likely to die from suicide as opposed to homicide. Now the first example is a little tricky because it, it's, uh, it, it no longer works uh, as intended. So what's more likely, to die from a traffic accident or stomach cancer? Yeah, it used to be. It used to be that uh, in the 70s, you were more likely to die from stomach cancer. But now, in fact, you are more likely to die from a traffic accident. Um, so things have changed over time. But here's the point. So in the 
1974, when, when this study was published, a typical guess what, was that a traffic accident is four times as likely um, as stomach cancer. But in 1974, again then, not now, um, stomach cancer is far more likely, almost twice as likely uh, in terms of just counts, right? 95,000 stomach cancer deaths versus 45,000 traffic uh, uh, deaths. And, and now it's actually, um, it works the other way around. And the key here to understanding this, this discrepancy is what um, is reported in newspapers, right? So you might have some personal encounters. You might have seen traffic accidents on the road, but probably a lot of the knowledge you use to, to, to make this judgment is based on what you read in newspapers, what you see on TV. And at that time, a traffic fatality was far more likely to be reported than a stomach cancer death. So again, perhaps our judgment of likelihood is based on you know, things that come to mind. Which things come to mind? Well, the things that are reported in the media, uh, the things that we see on TV or read in newspapers. In terms of the homicide versus suicide, these are the more recent statistics. Uh, murder rate is about six per 100,000, and suicide rate is almost double, um, 10.8 per 100,000. But people judge generally uh, a murder to be far more likely than suicide because we just hear more about murders. Uh, suicides are, well, just uh, not great. They don't form great uh, 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 media reports. So this, um, uh, what's reported in the media and what you derive from the media about cause of death can really skew, skew your perception about what's likely and what's not. So here's a graph, and again, this is a little outdated because this is from the 1970s. Some of the things have shuffled around a little bit, but it's mostly true. Um, now here are some causes of death. Uh, Tornado, flood, homicide, cancer, heart disease, etc. On the horizontal axis is the actual numbers of deaths per year, right, in, log in logarithm units. And here's the judged, this is the subjective, the estimated number of deaths per year. If you just ask somebody how many people would die from a tornado, let's say, or stroke, etc. And you can see that there's an interesting relationship where the more frequent causes of death that are objectively more frequent are indeed also judged more frequent by people. So that's good. But you can also see a, a pattern of, of overestimation and underestimation errors. If people on average would be, would be right in their estimates, their estimates, these points, should lie on this diagonal line. Right? This is the line where the Actual number equals the estimated number. But you can see for the low, the low, low likelihood cause of death, like a tornado or a flood, uh, botulism, I don't even know what botulism is. Very few people die of that every year. But people judge that those to be more likely cause of death than they actually are. On the other hand, if you take these very frequent causes of death, uh, heart disease, stroke, stomach cancer, etc., cetera, um, people don't believe that they're as likely as they actually are. And you can explain this by um, the statistics that you're exposed to, uh, right? You can't possibly keep track of the number of deaths in these various categories. You just hear about them. And you tend to hear more about tornadoes than heart disease, let's say. And so that's why you, uh, uh, by using this availability heuristic, you increase falsely the likelihood of tornado and decrease, because you hear a little less about heart disease, uh, you decrease your judge likelihood of heart disease. Does that make sense? OK. So availability, it's a clever strategy. It's a clever heuristic. Sometimes there's no other strategy you could use. Right? It's the only way, maybe, to come up with an answer how likely some things are. And it works well under many circumstances. That's very important. So psychologists love to come up with examples where human reasoning fails. 
uh, Kahneman's book is full of ways like, uh, how could you be wrong? This is so obvious, and this is how you should do it. But there are countless examples where our reasoning just works perfectly fine, right? The reason that we use these heuristics is because they work often. Now moving on to a different, um, different heuristic. This will relate to the representativeness heuristic. But let's illustrate this by an example. Suppose um, there's a hospital uh, that's, uh, that's observing the sequence of births in some maternity ward. And um, you have to judge which sequence is more likely. The exact sequence of a girl followed by a boy, followed by a girl, boy, boy, girl. Or the exact sequence of six boys in a row. And I should add a little bit of information here. For the sake of argument, let's assume that the base rate of boy-girl is 50-50. It isn't quite 50-50, but let's assume it's 50-50. And also, let's assume, um, which is pretty much true, that um, births of boy girls are like uh, coin tosses, pretty much. Uh, now, what do you think is more likely to observe this exact sequence A or this exact sequence B? Who, who, who would pick A? Can I ask you why would you pick A? Because it's, it's even, right? It's even number of boys and girls. And the other one seems just less likely. But if I told you it's 50-50, right? You go with that assumption. And if I told you it's, a, it's like a coin toss, would that influence your judgment at all? You still think that, that A is just more likely than B, right? Does, do other people use similar sort of reasoning to come up with answer A? So why would you choose answer B? Is there, I know that some people choose B. She didn't raise your hand. Yes? Um, I think it's, you're more likely to get repeated times in a row than that exact sequence in part A, because it's like alternating. Part B, it's only just one, so it's only like a 50 50, where that's the first one's like probability upon probability. Uh huh, okay. So, how many of you think it's actually the same probability? Yeah, can you explain why it would be actually the same? Um, because there's a 50% chance of getting a girl, a boy, or a 50% chance of getting a girl, so regardless, whichever sequence it is, it's 50%. Yes. Yeah, so exactly. So, so the probability of those, that exact sequence is the same. Um, now, if I asked you what is more likely, um, three boys and three girls in some order, or six boys in a row, would that change things? So that would be different. So if I say it's some order of three boys and three girls, that is far more likely than, than six boys in a row. But if I ask you about the specific sequence, they're all equally likely. Under those assumptions that I've given you, that it's like a ra random coin toss, which is pretty much true. Um, here's another example. Um, so now we are actually working with coin tosses. Uh, coin is flipped, what's more likely? This uh, sequence A, uh, so heads, tails, heads, tails, tails, heads, or uh, six heads in a row? Or are they equally likely? So this would be equally likely, right? But a lot of people think uh, that the first one is more likely because it looks more like a random coin toss sequence. It just looks like it's representative sequence A of a coin uh, that you're tossing uh, randomly. And so what's going on is you use a representativeness heuristic because A look, is more similar to a prototypical coin flip sequence. You judge it to be more likely. 
And again, often that's, that's a heuristic that works pretty well, but in this case, it leads to mistakes. So this is the representativeness heuristic, um, where you say I, the, 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 the probability that something is true, well, that's based on how uh, similar the instance is to other instances that, that come to mind. Now, just from a pure statistical point of view, if you judge this sequence to be more likely, then you believe somehow that there's a dependence between these uh, coin flips. Then somehow you must also believe that the, the, memory has, uh, the, the coin has a memory, that somehow it knows um, sort of what, what, it has, what has come up before, and therefore if you see a whole bunch of uh, heads in a, in a row, that a, a tail must come up because that makes it more similar. And that's a so-called gambler's fallacy. Um, gamblers often falsely believe that if they see a sequence of heads in a row, that tail must follow. Uh, but at every point in time, the, the probability of, of tail and heads is, is the same, regardless of the history. And you can exploit that in gambling situations um, if somebody doesn't know about that. Here, here's another example of um, the representativeness uh, heuristic. So here's a description of Linda. Uh, Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy, and as a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and she also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Now, what's, what's more likely, that Linda is a bank teller, or that Linda is a bank teller, and she's active in the feminist movement? Does anybody want to venture a guess? What's, what's more likely? Is that an option on the list? <laughs> so would you, would you pick B? Okay. Is there somebody who would pick A? And can, can I explain? Can I ask you to explain why you would pick A? Because there's only one variable. Yes. Yes. And uh, the addition of the second variable would make it less likely, less likely or equally likely, potentially, right? <laughs> yeah. So the, 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 the issue here, this, is, this question is all about probability. But when you, when you read this question, you think it's about representativeness. Like, which statement is more representative of this description, Linda? But that was not the question, right? It's about likelihood. But people confuse these types of questions very often. And so, um, this specific error of judging uh, B to be more likely than A is called the conjunction fallacy. In fact, if you do the experiment, 90% of people, they pick the second alternative, the bank teller and active in the feminist movement alternative. But it's logically incorrect, or from a probabilistic point of view, it's incorrect. And that's called a conjunction fallacy. So here's the idea. Suppose you have the set of all bank tellers, represented by this, this diagram over here, and you have the set of all feminists, and those two sets can overlap, so this overlapping set would represent the feminist bank tellers. And the set over here, um, that would be the set of bank tellers who are not feminists. And this wedge over here are the feminists who are not bank tellers. And now, from a purely probabilistic point of view, what's more likely that if I grab some random sample, that I grab a sample from the bank teller set or from the feminist bank teller set? So it's, it's less likely that I draw a sample from a smaller set, right? Uh, the set of bank tellers is just larger, or it could be the same. Um, but in all likelihood, it's just larger. <coughs> and so sometimes people think that the conjunction of two things is more likely than one of the things independently. So that's the conjunction fallacy idea. 
And this arises from the representative heuristic because, again, you, you, you judge this by, um, by similarity as opposed to some, some probabilistic calculation. Does this make sense, this, this diagram? Yeah? Can that also be a form of misinformation? Self-misinformation? Misinformation in what sense? It, it is, in fact, some, some researchers should say um, the experimenter is misinforming the, the subject here. Why do you even read this description at all, right? From a logical perspective, you don't even need the description. It's just a second, just a question by itself. You could logically answer it, right? But I read this description, and you're telling me about Linda, and you're telling me how she's involved, and then you're trying to think why is that relevant to the second part, right? And so some researchers claim there's no such, there's no fallacy here, right? You're just trying to understand what the experimenter is trying to get out of you. Uh, in some sense, it is misinformation, yes. But that's a more subtle point. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so this is just explaining that result. Um, Linda seems more representative of a feminist bank teller than just a bank terror alone. So, and that's why people give the uh, second answer. But from a pure probabilistic perspective, um, uh, you shouldn't do that. Um, now here's a tricky one. Um, there's a lot of beliefs um, about sports and what's going on with players as they uh, score or don't score. Now, if you think about basketball, and we think about free throws. Now, suppose you observe a sequence of free throws. Do you think somebody has a better chance of making a shot after this person just made his last two shots than if, you just, than if he just missed his last two shots? Same. Same? because you're primed now to say same. <laughs> Does that feel right, though? Is that the answer you really would like to give? Yeah. Or you know, you, you, you know that that's the answer you're supposed to give. No, I just figured like there's a 50% chance you'll make it and a 50% chance you won't. Yeah, it's not, not it, it could be 50% for some players, right? It could be 90% for other players, good players, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It goes down after he makes a shot. Goes down. You know that for a fact, or is this? Yeah. Really? I read your paper. Oh, OK. Um, interesting. Um, you're tapping into something else in what you read. Uh, but here, it's, it, it actually does not go down. Oh. Yeah. I feel like it's a, it's a confidence thing. And then it's like psychologically, like he feels that if he made the first two shots, like he's going to make the next one. Yes. <laughs> That is, that is an interpretation, right? That um, if somebody is making a whole bunch of shots in a row, that person is confident, has a hot hand, is, has streaky shooting, right? And that's why um, the vast majority of people, um, if you do like surveys, the vast majority of people would say yes, it is more likely to make a shot if you just made your previous two shots. But as it turns out, um, okay, and, and the explanation for this is what you just said, right? There's a, there's a change in confidence level, there's a hot hand, streaky shooting, right? And which, which seems to fluctuate over time. Sometimes you have it and sometimes you don't. And that's a popular way to look at uh, sequences of wins and losses or, you know, uh, making, making individual shots. But if you do the analysis, it is just as likely to make your next shot if you just missed your shot or if you just made your shot. 
it's conditionally independent. Some people are better than others, right? That, that's, that's very clear. But for the same person, that probability of making a shot does not change dramatically over time. Not within three, uh, the, the time span of three shots. If you look at a larger perspective of over several games, then it's quite possible that somebody might get injured or somebody might truly feel like a hot hand. And that person might slowly improve over time or decrease over time. But within three shots, it's just us reading into the randomness of the sequence. Uh, people are terrible at judging random events on a short time scale. We tend to read too much into the patterns and see patterns where there are actually no patterns at all. So there's lots of errors when we judge uh, sequential, uh, the probabilities of sequential events. So, so far I've, I've given lots of ex examples where um, the experiment is set up to trick you almost into the wrong answer. Um, and if you see, if you read about a whole bunch of these experiments, you might come to a sort of a pessimistic conclusion about um, human capabilities, that we fail in so many circumstances. We are terrible probabilistic reasoners. Um, we are so far from optimal behavior. But I don't think that's the right way to look at Tversky and Kahneman's um, findings. Because again, heuristics are very effective in many circumstances. And um, we just, as psychologists, when we come up with experiments, it's far more interesting to show when people go wrong than when they go right. Um, and so uh, we, we, be careful in drawing conclusions from these, from these experiments. Now here's, here's an example where the use of the heuristics might lead you to actually be surprisingly good. Better than if you don't use those heuristics. So this is a very simple question. Which city has a larger population, San Diego or San Antonio? And I should say, um, this, this, this example is a little dated because the, the population sizes, they, they uh, go back and forth. Sometimes San Antonio is actually bigger, sometimes um, San Diego is a little bigger. Uh, so the, the correct answer fluctuates actually over time. But does anybody have a strong opinion which one is actually the larger city? B? Did you Google it or? OK, sorry. Yeah, that's true. I made it all enough. All right. I made it too small. I can't read it myself. All right. So uh, when you ask American students, um, it's not an easy question because the population size is sort of roughly the same. Um, and so you see 66% accuracy uh, among University of Chicago undergraduates. Surprisingly, when at the time of the experiment, 100% of German students got this question correct. 100% of them. Now, are those German students smarter? Do they know more about the US and US cities than American students? That would be very strange. The point here is that the German students actually know less. But they use heuristics. They basically recognize San Diego as a city, right? Because it's a tourist city. <coughs> lots of people will visit there. Um, it's a nice city. They haven't heard as much about San Antonio doesn't have that same international acclaim, I guess. And in fact, San Diego is recognized as being a city by 78% of, of uh, German students. Only 4% of uh, students recognize that San Antonio was actually a city. And so they're saying, well, if, uh, I know San Diego is a city. And if I know it, if I recognize it, it's probably larger than the city that I don't recognize. That strategy is remarkably effective. Um, you can apply the same strategy of stock picking. If you pick the stocks that you recognize and don't invest in the ones that you don't recognize, that could actually give you a pretty good return. Um, with the idea being that um, uh, a stock with a well-known well brand 
The reason you recognize it is that the company must be doing well to have the money to uh, spend on advertising. So if you use this reasoning, like if I, if I hear about it, if I know about it, it's probably a good bet. Uh, so GigaRenter has done a lot of research showing that these very simple heuristics can give you remarkably accurate uh, decisions. Okay. Any question about this so far? So let's switch topics here and now talk about decision making. So if we now have to um, make some choices, we have some alternatives in front of us. Um, could involve money. There could be some risk involved. How do we pick the right um, alternative? And one interesting result is that uh, the framing of the alternatives matters greatly. If something is framed in terms of gains, like you can gain something, potentially, people will try to avoid risk. But when something is framed in terms of losing something, people seek out the risk in order to, to, to hope to avoid it. So here's an example. And this, this, this is, by the way, it's called the framing effect, where how the question is framed, how the alternatives are framed, influences your decision making. Okay, so here's, here's a little example. So suppose I give you $300, but then you have to select one of these two options. It's guaranteed in option A that you gain $100, or 50-50 you gain $200, or you gain nothing. Now it's somewhat subjective whether you should pick A or B. There's no right answer here, but just out of curiosity, how many people would pick A, where you picked a sure gain? How many people would pick B? Well, somewhat fewer, right? And this corresponds to the sort of experimental findings. Most people pick A. Most people like a sure bet. Right? If you can gain something that's guaranteed, you like that a little bit more than the potential of losing um, something. But there are individual differences, right? So some of you are more risk uh, prone, some of you are risk averse, and that can uh, influence your decision. So now let's frame the question a little differently. Now we start with $500. Give you $500, but in option A, you're guaranteed to lose $100. And in option B, 50-50 you lose $200 or you lose nothing. Now, how many, so can somebody say what they would, what they would pick and why? Any strong preferences here, A or B, in the second framing? Okay, so how, how many would pick, um, how, many, how many of you would pick B? And how many of you would pick A? Okay, so there's, there's some uncertainty about what, which one uh, you, you go with. If you do the experiment, you find that option B is preferred, not by everybody, but generally it's preferred by more people than option A. So now, uh, when the, the choices are framed in terms of losses, most people are willing to risk, um, or risk something to avoid you know, complete losses or heavy losses. Now why this is interesting is that this doesn't make sense from a rational point of view. If you believe that A is the better choice than B in problem one, then you should really not believe that B is the better choice than A in problem two. There's no reason for these uh, proportions to flip. And the reason is that in both cases, option A, you'll end up with $400, right? If I start with $300 here and you gain $100, you end up with $400. 
if I give you $500 but you're guaranteed to lose $100, you end up with $400. It's the same. In fact, all these options have an expected outcome of $400. Now, there are, there are reasons you can come up with that you would prefer B over A in problem one or B over A in problem two. And that, that could, could be actually rational. But what's not quite rational is that you believe that A is more attractive here than here. That is not rational. Because in both cases, you end up with $400. So the framing here, the framing in terms of gains and losses has influenced you in ways that makes you slightly irrational. Does that, does that make sense, this example? OK, so here, let's, uh, here's a much simpler framing example. If you, um, and it is a little dated, uh, so it's almost 20 years old, this example. If you give people a, a choice between an elegant cross pin whatever that is, and, and six dollars. Mm, well, subjective, but the majority of people go with the six dollars. But now if there are three prizes, you can pick between an elegant cross pin, six dollars, and an inferior pin. And you see there's some jokers in this experiment. Two percent <laughs> wanted to be funny and said, OK, I'll screw the experimenter. I'll pick the inferior pin. But now look at this, um, how the percentages have changed. 46% of people now pick the elegant cross pin compared to 36% in the first example. Having this third alternative in there influences, it is this third, third alternative which really is, is inferior in so many ways, has influenced your decision on the other alternatives. Um, so there's a framing here that suggests there's something about these pens. Consider these pens. Um, that here's a really elegant pen versus its inferior pen. But rationally, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense why you should change your mind uh, when this third option becomes available. Here's a similar example. If you present um, consumers, uh, this is like marketing research, if you present consumers putting a choice, you picked a single cheeseburger or this double cheeseburger, and I think this is from Europe, so it's expressed in euros, one euro versus two euro. Let's say 50-50% uh, of subjects, they're equally split on what's, what's most appealing. But now you present this third alternative, the triple cheeseburger. Well, it's not that appealing, right? But just the fact that it's there steers more people towards the second option. Right, all of a sudden, that second option, 10% more of people choose it. So which is a great finding for, for marketing researchers because it suggests that just having more options available to consumers, even if they never pick those options, it will steer people towards certain, certain decisions they would, they would not make otherwise. So some of you, um, uh, another example, if you, if you go to a nice restaurant and you look at the wine list, and the wines seem to be outrageously expensive. Like, who has the money to pay for these wines? Like, you know, $50 wine bottle, you know, who, who does that? And there's a really cheap one for whatever, um, $18. And there's a whole bunch of, you know, a little bit uh, sort of expensive ones. If the wine list would be very, be very small, you would always pick the cheapest one because people like the cheapest option. But because all those expensive wines are on that list as well, you're you're, you're fooled into believing that you ought to pick something at least that's not the cheapest, right? And once you steer consumers into picking not the cheapest but the second cheapest, um, companies have already won, right? They've, they've influenced your decision making and steered you into decision, deciding something that you actually didn't want in the first place. So I'll skip this uh, example. Um, this is a little involved. And let's go to the next uh, and last topic, reasoning. So in reasoning, we, um, it's all about what conclusions we can draw from the available evidence. 
there are different types of reasoning. There's um, inductive reasoning. There's deductive reasoning. In inductive reasoning, your conclusions might be um, more probabilistic in nature. Uh, you're not entirely sure if something is true or false. Um, and so you're extrapolating from evidence, but there's some uncertainties involved. Deductive reasoning on the other hand that, that involves re uh, logic, right? Something by logical reasoning is absolutely true or just absolutely false. There's no degrees of belief. And one interesting finding uh, in the psychology of reasoning is that people try to confirm their beliefs when they reason more often than um, disconfirm them. People don't like to be challenged in terms of their beliefs. They just seek out the evidence that, that fits their beliefs in the first place. Now here's a little abstract experiment that's, that shows um, this bias of people to confirm their beliefs or confirm hypotheses. So suppose you have four cards, um, and on each card there's either a letter, or, or, or on each card there's a letter on one side and there's a number on the other side. Okay, and you have these four example cards, and now you're given a rule. If a card has a vowel on one side and has an even number on the other side, that's the rule. Now logically, what cards do you need to turn over to test the correctness of this rule? So some of you say E. You have to turn over E. Why, why do you have to turn over E? Why would you have to turn over E, the card E, to test whether this rule is true or not? So it is a vowel on one side. So if you find on the other side an even number, then it's consistent. And if you find something, if you find an uneven number, then it's false, right? Okay, that's good. So this card you definitely need to turn over. Now some of you might pick the card four. Now is that a correct choice? No, 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 no. Very good, okay. Yeah. Now, for some of the people that said no, why? Why is that? Yes. So you have to turn over the card seven, because, as you said, that can potentially disprove the rule, right? Because if you now see um, a vowel on the other side, then you know that rule is not true. But still, now let's go back to this four example. Why should you not, or why don't you have to turn over that card? So suppose you find, suppose you find something consistent, like you find the, um, um, you find a vowel on the other side. Why is this not relevant? So, and this is the confusing bit. So if you turn over this card, it doesn't matter what you find on the other side. It's irrelevant. Because if you find a consonant on the other side, um, th the rule doesn't say anything about what should be on the other side if you find a consonant. So it's, it, this four is irrelevant. But you, you're, you're thinking of turning over the four because it, it, it's confirming, it's try, you're trying to confirm the hypothesis. But as some of you know, uh, you should really turn over the seven, which is somewhat counterintuitive because that has the potential to disconfirm a rule. Now this takes a little while to, to sink in. The book uh, goes through this example also in some detail. Now here's one way to make this uh, a little bit easier. Suppose the rule is something that you are familiar with instead of this abstract vowel consonant thing. If the rule is, um, if a person is drinking beer, then the person must be over 21. And you can see these people that are drinking beer, drinking Coke, 16 years of age, 22 years of age. This is, these are cards, in a sense, that you can turn over. And then you can see if, if they drink beer, what their age is, 
If you, if you know their age, you can see if they're drinking beer. So which ones do you need to turn over now? So this one seems more intuitive, right? So drinking beer, right? That would, that would be good to know. And this, this one, see you know, if somebody that's 16 years of age is, is drinking beer or not, because th if that's the case, then the, the rule is violated. Now, most people can do this task fairly well. The previous one, not so much. So when it comes to abstract sort of scenarios, people really show this confirmation bias. Uh, here, not so much. OK, this is the last um, example. So let's, let's do a little in-class demo. So we're trying to find a rule or concept about numerical sequences. And I'm saying that the sequence 248, that is an example of a sequence or a, a concept that I have in mind. Okay. So 248, I would say yes, that is a positive example of this concept. And now you can ask me for other sequences, and your goal is to figure out what is the rule, what's the underlying rule. So give me a sequence of three numbers. Which one was it? Can I skip you? <laughs> Oh, okay. We <laughs> Any other ones? Thirty-six? Three six nine. Four, five, six. Four, five, six. Does anybody have an idea what, what rule it is? Yes. That's right. It is that simple. The numbers have to go up. Now, so when you see 248, you're thinking about you know, powers of 2 or even numbers or something like that. Um, and so, you're, you have some hypotheses in mind, and you try to confirm those hypotheses. But it takes a lot of work to disconfirm those hypotheses, um, and especially to disconfirm um, yeah, so some of the ones that are suggested by the initial evidence. And so Wason uh, suggests that this, is, this shows another confirmation bias. And so, there's lots of people that um, have argued that um, when we reason with evidence in various situations, um, sometimes our confirmatory strategies don't work very well. Uh, Popper, uh, who worked in the philosophy of science, he argued that scientists really should try to disconfirm uh, their hypothesis because that might be more informative. But there's a debate going on about what is, what is the best thing to do. Uh, maybe it does make sense if you have very specific hypotheses in mind, like it's powers of two, to try to confirm that. Uh, maybe it does make sense if, if there are very few possibilities. And so we don't quite know what, what is the right way uh, here to do experiments. Um, so that's it for today. I'll see you guys uh, next week.